course, had, had been there and had recorded the panpipes of Jajuka. Interestingly, what he hears in the music that he finds in Morocco, um, Berber music and, 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 and Arabic music, is um, a quite different scale, but a scale which he then relates to the blue note, for want of a better term, that he'd identified in the voice of Elvis Presley and then subsequently in the, the, the black musicians who Elvis Presley was drawing on. And I think he finds the same soulfulness in some of these voices that he hears in North Africa. And without turning that into some sort of uh, uh, corny notion of uh, everything connects, um, I think there is a similarity there that uh, you can understand exactly what it was he was picking up on. When Led Zeppelin officially disbanded in December 1980, it was in the slipstream of manifold personal tragedy for Robert Plant. Following the deaths of both his young son, Carrack, and his childhood friend, John Bonham, Plant stepped out of public view and away from his career as a recording artist. Though he continued to perform, his appearances took place in the semi-anonymity of the Honey Drippers, a combo of West Midlands musicians that toured small clubs and venues in the Birmingham area with a repertoire of blues and R&B standards. After John's death, um, obviously Robert still wanted to play music, so we sort of just started doing that for fun. And it was a lot of fun, you know? Like we were doing Albert King stuff. And I think there was some Sonny Boy Williamson. And there was a whole, you know, across the board stuff, all stuff that Robert had liked for years, you know? And there was so much stuff to draw on. I mean, Robert's got a huge record collection, you know. In fact, he used to search us on the way back out in case we nipped away with some... Oh, I shouldn't have said that, should I? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was quite a clandestine operation, really, because I remember one show... Oh, he did a couple of universities where Robert actually had, like, a woolly hat on and he was taking tickets, you know. And obviously, people didn't realise this, you know. So, it, yeah, it was it was just a lot of fun. It was a bit like we our local pub is the Queen's Head in Wolverley. It was a bit like the Queen's Head annual outing, you know, only doing a few gigs. Though the Honey Drippers had provided Plant with a chance to mine the back catalogue of his musical influences, when he eventually recovered the itch to record, it was with an ear towards finding a contemporary sound. In 1982. Robert returned from some time away in Morocco to begin work at Rockfield Studios in Wales on his debut solo album, Pictures at Eleven. It's OK doing covers and all that, but I, I know I've got, or I had, a lot more creativity in trying to maybe move it somewhere else to take, again, all those influences and what influences you're playing and, and create something else out of it with that feeling still but turn it into something else. I met him in a pub in Kidderminster and we had a talk about it. And I actually said, look, will you give me the chance to try and write something with you? To which he agreed. And that is really how it started. I was kind of embalmed and, and if you like, uh, swimming in, in, in a particularly uh, um, I suppose, exclusive little pool for a long time. Not that that was a particularly great place to be a lot of the time, but it was still there and I was still part of it all. And, but these changes come anyway in, in, a, in, a, in a life, whatever you do. And also I was excited because I could call all the shots and I could make all the mistakes and all the errors and, and, and go either way, one way or the other and just, just do it. said, I didn't think we'd do anything like this. You know, and it, it was, I think at that point, we thought, well, this is going to work, you know.
just manifested itself. I mean, and yeah, one of the first tracks I, I did, like Fat Lip, I remember Jez and I came up with this piece of music. And uh, Benji Laferb was also very instrumental into all these goings on, you know. Benji would record it, and then um, Robert wasn't even there, you know. And then we came back, and he'd done this vocal, and I just went, wow, I would have never have thought of that in a million years. You know, it's like something I would have never imagined. And, and it, I think it gave us a lot of confidence. Sometimes Robert would play a bit of bass or he'd even get on the kit, you know. We would just just follow our noses as such. And that sounds good, that sounds good. I, I, often I'd come up with a guitar idea, but obviously I would compress far too much stuff into these things, you know. And, and Robert, obviously thinking about his vocal lines or whatever, would sort of just prise it apart, saying, you've got enough for three different things going on here, you know? Um, and, and we'd just pull it out a bit, you know? And um, I think a lot, a lot of it just developed like that. It was, it, was, it was intuitive. Pictures at 11 proved to be a huge success, reaching the top five on both sides of the Atlantic and establishing Plant as a credible artist beyond his place in Zeppelin. Though the album was a strong commitment to the modern adult rock sound of the early 80s, it included a track in which Robert furthered his exploration of Eastern musical styles, in particular, his enthusiasm for the famed Egyptian singer, Um Kalsum. As on my first album, Pictures at 11, I wrote a track called Slow Dancer with Robbie Blunt, and um, it was based on an orchestral part from Um Kalsum in Cairo, and it was as as big and as beautiful and as emotive as you could ever wish. and I listened to some of that music up at Palomino and um, we obviously were influenced by it, you know. It probably was a chance for Robert to do something on his own in that vein, but I saw it as being probably the closest thing that we ever did that sounded like Zeppelin. He had to allude to that part of Zeppelin because I think it, it, it was expected of him. I know he loves that music anyway, but that's maybe the only track where I can say, yeah, that's, that was a bit Zeppelin-esque. Robert's journey through Arabian music, which had weaved its way across Zeppelin's catalogue in the 70s, saw him alight on the figure of Umm Kalsum as one of the foremost exponents of the blue note. Born in Egypt in 1898, Kalsum rose to national prominence in the 1920s. By the 50s, she had become the most famous singer in the history of Arabic music and was popularly known as the Star of the East. She was the great diva of the Arabic world. Almost like the mother of, of not just the nation, but the whole Arab musical world. So, you know, immense, immense figure. Robert Plant has heard this voice uh, following his sort of travels to Morocco and North Africa in the early 1970s. He recognises something very special in, in, in this voice, in a quality that, uh, that he wants to capture. 
when there's an adamance about putting a point over with singers, you know. And Um Kal Sum, who inspired me for that track, Slow Dancer. I mean, she could set the world on fire just by holding a note for a minute while the, her orchestra just stood on a, a mm. B flat and then she would just drop her hand and Egypt would burst.